Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I welcome you here today on behalf of C. Bradley Thompson, Executive Director of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism, for a conversation with Professor Flagg Taylor on Baklav Havel and the problem of dissent. My name is Michael Hoffpower. I'm Associate Director of the Lyceum Program here at Clemson University and Clinical Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science. The Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism and its Lyceum Program are dedicated to the study of the moral, political, and economic foundations of a free society. The Lyceum Program is a great books program that offers scholarship to incoming students and a minor to current students of Clemson University. Its curriculum ranges from ancient to modern political philosophy to the American founding to the political theory of capitalism. You can learn more about the Lyceum Program by visiting our website at clemson.edu slash lyceum. Now, tonight's talk is one of our Lyceum lectures, which have been made possible with the generous support of the Jack Miller Center. We thank the Jack Miller Center for helping us have conversations like these that are centered on the principles and institutions that make a free way of life possible. For more information on the Jack Miller Center, please visit jackmillercenter.org. Before we begin, a quick word on the format of tonight's conversation. It's quite straightforward. Professor Taylor will speak with us for a bit, then we'll open things up to a Q&A. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the talk by typing them into the Q&A box. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Flagg Taylor. Professor Taylor is Associate Professor of Political Science at Skidmore College. His research specialty is in the history of political thought and American government, especially regarding the question of executive power. Professor Taylor is the co-author of The Contested Removal Power, 1789 to 2010. He's editor of The Great Lie, classic and recent appraisals of ideology and totalitarianism, and The Long Night of the Watchman, essays by Vaclav Binda, 1977 through 1989. He's currently writing a book on Czech descent in the 1970s and 1980s, and he's host of the Enduring Interest podcast, which I highly recommend. You can check it out at enduringinterest.podbean.com. Professor Taylor holds a BA from Kenyon College and an MA and PhD in political science from Fordham University. Thank you for joining us, Professor Taylor. Great to see you. Thank you, Professor Hoff Power. It's great to be here. Uh, first of all, thanks to, to Clemson University, thanks to the Lyceum program, and especially thanks to the Jack Miller Center. I've been affiliated with them for a long time as a, as a grad student. I remember a great, great seminar, and I still met, met people who I'm very still great friends with. So it's, it's great to be involved with, with a Jack Miller sponsored event. And uh, I, wish, I wish, of course, I could be uh, down. Uh, in South Carolina at this point. I could use some upstate New York relief, but uh, Zoom, Zoom will have to do. Uh, so I'm going to talk, as, as Professor Hoffpower said, for uh, 30, 35 minutes, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions, and I look forward, forward to those. Uh, my talk is going to be in, in three parts. I'm just going to give a brief, very brief historical background. Then I'm going to talk about this letter that uh, Havel wrote uh, to the uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party called Dear Do Dr. Husak. And then I'm going to talk about a few plays that he wrote around the same time, uh, then offer some concluding, concluding remarks, and, and we'll get to your questions. So the, the time that we're talking about tonight is 1975. This turned out to be a very important year for, for Václav Havel. Uh, his, his writings were banned at this point, and he was barred from working in the theater. Uh, he had also not been allowed to to study to study theater or literature uh, because of his bourgeois family connections. Um, any hopes for political change in Czechoslovakia, of course, had been dashed in 1968 with with the Prague Spring when Soviet and other Warsaw Pact troops invaded the country and crushed this reform movement. In the aftermath of this invasion, the Communist Party reasserted control through a program that they called normalization. And they hunted out any hint of heterodoxy or nonconformity and expelled anyone who they suspected of, of any of those things. 
And so nor the normalization regime that Havel is experiencing um, was one of a kind of return of the hardliners and a very swift and decisive social crackdown. It, it led to a very pacified population. Uh, population. And so um, from, from what Havel tells us in 1975, he just got tired of his own passivity. And he decided, quote, to compel them, meaning the party, uh, for a change to deal with something they hadn't counted on. And so he wrote this very famous, now very famous, open letter to Gustav Husak, the general secretary of the Communist Party. Um, this was not his first foray in sort of dissent writing. He had said some, said some things at writers' union meetings in the late 60s, but nonetheless, this is a very significant kind of public statement of, of dissent. And it was made around the time when really no one was dissenting in any way. Around the same time, he wrote this one act play called Audience. And it was the first play in a trilogy about this character we'll, we'll talk more about later called Ferdinand Vanyek, uh, who bears a striking resemblance to uh, Havel himself. The second play in the trilogy, The Unveiling, was written later that same year. And so what I want, what I want to argue tonight is that these writings, this letter to Husak and these plays all written around the same time, show that Havel is grappling in a kind of new way with the problem of dissent and considering it from, from a standpoint maybe he had not considered it before. Um, one way to think about Havel's letter to Husak, so here I'm gonna talk about this, this is kind of the first part of the talk. Um, think of it as a kind of response to the State of the Union address. You know, you get the poor sap from the opposing party who has to you know, say something about what's just been said. Well, um, Husak hadn't given an address, but Havel's letter has the feel of a response um, to, to a statement that Husak might have made. And so Havel is concerned that on the surface, Czechoslovak society seems very normal. It's very orderly. People are going to work, raising their families, educating, uh, educating their children, building homes. Um, people are carving out a decent life as best they can. So perhaps maybe the party might consider Ah, well, it seems like everyone's pretty much satisfied, and therefore this regime, this communist regime, um, is is legitimate. And Havel, of course, wants to 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 explain to people that the opposite is the case. That no matter how quiet society is, no matter how um, normal things seem, right, all this normality, all this quiet, uh, is being purchased with with something that's deeply wrong. And so. He, he argues that ultimately the, the reason that people go about their daily life is, is fear. And he doesn't mean uh, fear in the sense of a kind of precise cowering in the face of some threat, but a kind of vaguer, more ubiquitous fear than that. And so this fear, of course, has to do with the omnipresence of state security or the, or the secret police. And people knew that their behavior was being monitored in one way or another every day. They would have had to fill out questionnaires about their recent past all the time. They would have had to go to union meetings uh, and, and they would have to know what they were expected to say at those meetings, how they were expected to vote at those meetings. Uh, they would have to have taught their children what to say in school, what the teachers wanted to hear, and probably especially things not to say at school, how to avoid trouble. I could have, you know, go on with these examples, but people knew how to behave in order to, to kind of purchase a quiet, a quiet life. Havel emphasizes that the punishment for nonconformity was nothing like it had been in the 1950s, right? At this point in Czechoslovak uh, political life, there were not these mass public trials. People are not being sentenced to eight years to work in labor camps in the uranium mines. People are not tortured. The oppression had become more subtle and selective, but as Havel argues, it's not the absolute value of a threat that matters, but the relative value. So the idea was everyone has something to lose and the possibility is of what one might lose would have been quite broad. And so you might be demoted at work. Um, your children might be prevented from studying at the school where you wanted them to study, or in, you know, maybe worst case, um, you might be moved from a kind of white collar office work to suddenly you know, you're working at the Prague Metro as a, as a janitor. And so the point Havel's making is people at all levels of society could be punished with something. And so everyone knew that outward conformity was the fastest way to be left alone. And so once everyone acknowledges that conformity is the best way to protect yourself, some people also figure out that it's that's a pretty good way to get ahead, 
that you can kind of secure advantages for yourself in society by your outward professions of loyalty. This also means that very few people take these outward expressions of loyalty to be expressions of true, sincere belief. Everyone's quite cynical and everyone kind of figures that everyone's probably wink, wink. Uh, you know, we don't really believe this stuff, but we're mouthing these slogans because we know it's, it's necessary and that's what we have to do. Um, and Havel even emphasizes even party members, right, are assumed not to be terribly sincere. Uh, and so he says, quote, the number of people who sincerely believe that the official propaganda, what the official propaganda says, and who selflessly support the government's authority is smaller than it has ever been. But the number of hypocrites rises steadily, and up to a point, every citizen is in fact forced to be one. And so the two poles motivating people's behavior might be a vague fear, instinct for self-preservation on the one hand, and eager adaptation to secure advantages on the other. Those are the two poles. But Havel says there's this vast middle that explains people's behavior in between. And he suggests that vast middle uh, are motivated mostly by apathy and indifference. And so there's a kind of surrender to habit, a kind of surrender to what Havel calls, who he sometimes uses this Heideggerian language, everydayness. So the idea here is that people simply perform the routine tasks of conformity because it's what they've always done. They don't really think twice about it anymore. You might, some of your, um, some people in the audience might know Havel's very famous essay, The Power of the Powerless, where he talks about the green grocer who hangs up the sign, workers of the world unite in his shop window. Right? Why does the green grocer do this? Well, he just hangs up the sign because it was sent to him by management. He doesn't really think the workers of the world are going to unite. He does it every morning. He doesn't think twice about it. So Havel explains this seductive psychology um, of his fellow citizens as, as follows. I'm going to share my screen and uh, give, you, give you this quotation because it's a bit, bit long. So Havel writes, participation in political rituals in which no one believes is pointless, but it does ensure a quiet life. And would it be any less pointless not to participate? One would gain nothing and lose the quiet life in the bargain. Most people are loath to spend their days in ceaseless conflict with authority, especially when it can only end in the defeat of the isolated individual. So why not do what's required of you? It costs you nothing, and in time, you cease to bother about it. It's not worth a moment's thought. So he's eager, Havel's eager to show Husak and the party what the foundation of the regime actually is. At the top, you have naked careerism, where the most unscrupulous people thrive. At the bottom, you have a kind of fear-driven adaptation to hang on to whatever gives you a sense of normalcy. And in the middle, you have this apathy, indifference, routine performance in order to preserve whatever minor privileges that ensure you a quiet life. So you might say that Havel has undertaken a kind of regime of, uh, analysis that's paired with a corresponding soul type, very much like what Socrates does in book eight of the Republic. Havel writes, quote, in the foreground stands the imposing facade of grand humanist ideals, and behind it crouches the modest family house of a socialist bourgeois. Bourge you know, calling people bourgeois fighting words in, in the communist context, right? So, <laughs> so let's look at this image a little more closely. The regime's totalitarian shape, its omnipresence, its demand for constant affirmation, it's pervasive lying. What this results in is an extreme privatization of life, right? Very paradoxical. The public is pure ritual. What one gives, uh, one gives what the ritual demands, but only out of a cynical desire to preserve one's concrete private goods. Nobody has any interest in the possibility of social or political improvement. And even more importantly, I want to emphasize this, Havel argues that nobody has even a sliver of confidence in exerting any influence of any kind in an outward direction, right, on the kind of nature of social and political life. So there's a deep sense of resignation. 
And the resignation is grounded both a rational assessment of the possible, but also a kind of inertia. Uh, one, one very interesting example of this, I, was, I once interviewed a, a young writer um, who was probably about your age, college age um, at, at the time, um, where he's this anecdote that I'm about to relate. He had some connections to Havel and his circle of writers. And so he was lucky enough to sit in on some of their underground seminars and their kind of literary salons. Uh, and he told me that the most frightening thing about waking up during these times was, was, was waking up and just thinking, this is just going to go on forever. Nothing will ever change, ever. And that attitude was not um, you know, shared only by people like him, right? This is kind of the widespread default attitude. Um, and so this deep hopelessness is paired with a decisive turn towards making life as pleasant as possible. And so the, the, what Havel shows is that the regime welcomes this. They encourage it. They like, they like this, this depoliticization. Um, the more people cling to material things, the more willing they will be to do whatever is asked of them to preserve those things. And he even says there's a deeper reason. Havel writes, quote, by fixing a person's whole attention on his mere consumer interests, it is hoped to render him incapable of realizing the ex increasing extent to which he has been spiritually, politically, and morally violated. That's the nerve of the problem for Havel. He wants to show Husak and the party and his readers that the surface peace and order of Czechoslovak life does not betoken any kind of consolidation or legitimacy. Yet if he's right about this soul-shaping aspect of the Prague Spring iteration of totalitarianism, then the task for any dissident is very great indeed, right? Because the people's horizon of concern and circle of moral action have shrunk and their own spiritual violation or political violation or moral violation won't even be apparent to them. And even if you convince them through argument that they'd had, that they've been violated in this way, maybe they won't be willing to bear the costs that would surely come their way were they to undertake any kind of heterodox thinking and action. And so um, first takeaway from this letter, I think, is that Havel wants to show that the problem of dissent is in a way both a problem of knowledge, knowing what's in front of you, but also a problem of desire, sort of wanting, wanting the, right, the right things. Um, now, what if your average Czechoslovak citizen who accepted this bargain offered by the regime encountered someone crazy enough to refuse the bargain? This person would appear to his neighbors as, quote, Havel says, an eccentric, a fool, a Don Quixote. And in the end, this person would be regarded inevitably with some aversion. And so Havel thought the problem of dissent might be investigated even better, not through argument and analysis in the way that the letter to Husak unfolds, but through drama, through a play. And so his portrayal of this guy Vanyak um, is, a, is an effort of him, is an effort by Havel to think through what this encounter with a Don Quixote by ordinary folks might look like. Havel wrote the play Audience uh, around the same time, the spring of 1975, and he read it to his friends at his cottage uh, outside of Prague in June uh, of that year. It's called Haradacek, which means like mini, mini castle. So not, not much of a castle, but a nice, nice little retreat uh, an, hour, an hour outside of Prague. And he used to have these literary salons there and his friends, you know, novelists and playwright friends would read, read their manuscripts uh, to one another. And apparently when he read this play to them, they just could not stop laughing. They just thought it was absolutely hysterical. And he was pleased enough to write another play about the character Vanyak um, later that year. And then he would write a third Vanyak play in 1978. And Vanyak became such a thing among his uh, fellow writer friends that three other writers would, would take up their pen and write plays about the same character, uh, which is crazy and kind of interesting. I'm not sure, I haven't done research on this, but I'm not sure that that's happened if, if you have multiple playwrights writing about the same, same character. It's very interesting. So anyway, now part two of the talk, let's talk about Ferdinand, Ferdinand Vanyak and, and, um, and these two plays. 
who is Vanyak? So Vanyak is, is a writer of some renown. Uh, he's part of, we know he's a part of a group of prominent artists. We know that he's attracted the attention of state security, although it's never made clear in the plays what exactly he's done to, to reward, be re rewarded with this attention. Um, he, see, he comes off as very shy, kind of reticent, even socially awkward. We know that he lives with his wife, but he has no children. Um, and it means when you read these plays, you'll notice that Vanyak speaks much less often than his interlocutors do. Sort of lot, lots of times, you, you know, he'll, he'll reply with one word answers, nods. Um, some, of the, some of the stage direction is important. And it's obviously difficult to, to communicate that, but anyway. Um, so the first play audience takes place at a brewery. Um, Vanyak uh, finds himself working there. He rolls barrels in the cold, dank basement an unpleasant task which he apparently performs without complaint he is asked to come to the brewmaster the sort of uh, brewery management office and the play begins when Havel knocks on the door of the office and and the brewmaster kind of wakes up from his stupor and you know says Vanya come in an atmosphere of kind of discomfort and uncertainty looms over this whole conversation for most of the encounter because we the audience and Vanyak as well, they don't really understand why he's been summoned. It's very unclear. The brewmaster asks him how he's doing. He inquires about the plays he writes, and he wonders if he might br bring one of his actress friends, one of his really good looking actress friends by the brewery and hang out with the boys. Wouldn't that be a, kind of a cool thing for us, you know, blokes down at the brewery? Uh, there's also very circular, um, nature to the conversation. Topics are, are repeated, phrases are repeated over and over again. There's some stock cliches that, that come up again and again. Vanyak is repeatedly asked why he's depressed and Vanyak says, I'm not depressed. The two cliches in particular that are important that are repeated by the brewmaster are, are, are first, in translation, the British translation, you have uh, brew, the brewmaster saying, people are proper bastards. In the American English translation, it's people are basically a-holes, right? <laughs> Sorry to offend the sensibilities of the, of the audience. The other, uh, the other stock phrase that comes up over and again, over and over again is people gotta stick together. You know, we're all basically alike, we gotta stick together. We're all good, we're all good guys. Um, he offends Vanyak eventually by, a, by suggesting that Vanyak would be, would be better off if he let go of some of his friendships. The brewmaster gives him a little advice. You know, I know you hang out with some suspect people. Your life would be easier if you just, if you just, uh, you know, drop them by the the wayside. Things get interesting when Vanyak uh, is offered a fancier position at the brewery. The brewmaster says, "Wouldn't you like to work in an office? It could get you out of that dank basement. You could uh, shuffle some paper and and um, you know, be a, be a little warmer. Be a much nicer place to work." Vanyak seems intrigued by this. He's like, yeah, I know some foreign languages. I can type pretty well. That sounds good to me. At this point, the brewmaster suggests their friendship is established, and then he offers to tell Vanyak something important. He says a childhood friend of his, a high school buddy, Tonda, happens to work in state security, and his bosses have been asking about Vanyak, and they've been saying to Tonda, you got to get someone at the brewery to give us some reports on Vanyak's activities. We got to know what's going on. You know, we know he's probably up to no good. Please, you know, get, get, uh, so the Tonda gets in touch with the brewmaster and says, you got to give us something on this guy. We got to know what he's doing. All that we know from the play, the only gossip that uh, the brewmaster says that he has on Vanyak is that he has been seen uh, in town with a lady from the bottling plant, not his wife and that he has used the guys from the maintenance uh, staff at the, uh, at the brewery to come, come to his home and repair his central heating. You know, both not great, but you know, these, are, these are not deep crimes in the grand scheme of the, uh, of the party. It's not enough to fill out any interesting report and satisfy state security. So finally, after the brewmaster, and I kid you not, you can, you can look this up in the play, he, he drinks, he downs his 11th beer, 11. We get the big ask. The brewmaster says to Vanek, you're an intellectual, you're a writer. You know, you know the political world. 
why don't you just write these reports yourself? Write whatever you want, you know, write in a way that gets you into no trouble at all. Just give me, give me something. I'll give it to my friend Tonda. He'll give it to his superiors, right? Everyone, everyone gets ahead. Vanyak declines. He tells the brewmaster, I can't inform him of myself. He's pressed a little further. He says, there's a principle involved. I can't participate in something that I find repugnant. And this leads to the brewmaster to kind of lose it. He, he, he launches into this invective filled outburst by far the longest speech in the play. He tells Vanyak that it must be nice clinging to your principles, right? Staying clear of the muck and mire of everyday life. He says, you fancy intellectuals, you people of importance, you can even make a living off your principles, right? But the rest of us ordinary folk, the nobodies, we've, we've got to do our best and we have to crawl through that muck and mire every day. And the easiest way to make everyone able to crawl through that muck and mire, right, with the least possible um, problem, right, is for Banyak to do this little thing, write this report. You know, he's a really good writer. It would take him 10 minutes. And so the brewmaster's speech kind of demonstrates the truth of those contradictory cliches that he's been deploying throughout the whole play. People are proper bastards, and we've got to stick together. The system is rotten. Everyone gets what they can. Yet the only way through that system is to find these innovative ways to accommodate it with as little damage to themselves as possible. In this sense, right, I, I think the brewmaster, you can make a case, is right. The Vanyak's selfish. His principles are selfish. They enable him to opt out of the system and keep his hands clean. Then we reach the strangest thing about the play, its ending. After this long, blistering speech, the brewmaster slumps down onto his desk and begins to sob. The sob eventually turns to snores because he passes out because he's had, you know, now 13 beers probably. Vanyak stands up, tells his boss not to be depressed. So repeating this earlier uh, phrase the brewmaster used, <laughs> leaves the office, waits for a few minutes. It's hard to tell how long he waits outside. It's not, it's not precise in the stage direction. But he knocks on the door and re-enters as if he's starting the conversation over. And he uses one of the stock phrases uttered by the brewmaster in their previous conversation, everything's effed up. And then when he's offered a beer, instead of refusing it like he had the previous conversation, he drinks the beer. Curtain, close curtain, play over. Very strange. Some people read this play to argue that Vanyak comes back in and restarts this conversation because now he's seen the light, he's gonna inform on himself, right? He's convinced by the brewmaster's argument. Others read it to suggest that he's not, he's not gonna inform, but he's learned something and he's gonna handle the situation differently than the way he handled it before, right? So very quickly, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the second play and then offer some concluding thoughts. The second play, Vanyak meets two members of his own class in a way, middle class. He, he, he goes to his friend's house, Michael and Vera, who are having him, Vanyak, over to their flat to celebrate their recent acquisition of various trinkets and artifacts that decorate their home. So think of that moment in, uh, in Fixer Upper when, when Chip and Joanna do the, do the reveal and you see that new beautiful, beautiful handiwork, right? Um, the couple seems totally consumed by their love of these objects. They include a Turkish scimitar, a Rococo musical clock, an electric almond peeler, and even a confessional that they've taken from a church that was being closed. Um, now, Michael's ability to acquire these objects means that he probably travels abroad, and therefore he has a kind of privileged employment. He's not a party member, but the party would not let someone have such employment if they didn't think he was, he was reliable. And so Vanyak enters this flat, and, and he's invited to what seems like just an art exhibition by these two old, two old friends of his. But what's really going on, right, uh, are two things. On the one hand, Michael and Vera want Vanyak's approval. They want him to endorse their way of life. 
They want him to find joy in these material objects that they find joy in. And on the other, they also want Vanyek, uh, they want to, they purport to help Vanyek to what they call his situation. And his situation, right, is that he has this crappy job at a brewery. He's in trouble with the regime. He's, you know, he's constantly monitored. He's interrogated probably, you know, fairly often. They think his marriage is, seems kind of crappy. His wife doesn't really cook. Their house isn't decorated very well. They know that they're moving boxes that haven't been unpacked in his flat. You know, horror of horrors. Settle in, you know. And in a moment of peak awkwardness, they even suggest certain lovemaking techniques that Ferdinand should employ with his, with his wife. It's a great, great moment in the play. It's sort of like, what is happening? I cannot believe what I want. But the dialogue, if you pay attention, right, really reveals that despite their surface excitement about their material objects, the couple is deeply unhappy. Vera bursts into tears when, when um, Vanya tries to leave the house because he's just kind of had enough and he's kind of bored. They're seeking Vanyak's approval because they can't help but respect his courage and moral witness. And so they understand that Havel's way of life is a quiet rebuke to their way of life. But the only way they know to fix it is to try to get Vanyak to endorse them, right? They, they, want, they want to attract Vanyak over to their, to their side. Um, then he can have a better job and he can have a quiet life filled with these consumer pleasures that they like. And so what, what Havel shows with Michael and Vera is a kind of willful moralism that doesn't really seek the good of others, but that really they seek the vindication of their own selfishness. And I should say just very quickly, the end of the play um, is very similar to, to what happened at the end of Audience. It looks like Vanyak is going to leave. Um, Vera throws a fit and Havel, or Havel, <laughs> Vanyak, not Havel. Vanyak seems to be shamed enough where he, grab, he grabs the, the flowers that Vera has thrown on the floor, quietly puts them back in the vase and kind of slinks back down on the couch, presumably kind of restarting the conversation again. So very much in the same vein as the, the audience, the earlier play. So concluding thoughts. Readers or watchers of the play are left with two ways of thinking about Ferdinand Vanyak. Havel shows that there's a kind of deep chasm that separates Vanyak on the one hand from his interlocutors on the other. Even though Vanyak is kind of shy and doesn't really have an interest in parading uh, around his, his moral witness, the fact that he's a kind of dissident, that superiority is what people feel when they're around him. So Vanyak becomes a kind of living reproach to the other people in the play. People have a kind of bad conscience. And Vanyak's refusal to become enveloped in the moral and social economy of, of totalitarianism comes off as selfish, right? You stick to your principles. Well, that's selfish. You're not helping you know, everyone else. Remember the brewmaster's speech. You're not helping everyone else kind of navigate their way through this disgusting world. You're just opting out of it and sort of displaying your, your superiority. Well, maybe it's easier for Vanya to do that because he's a, he's a prominent writer. He has this reputation. Maybe he has friends abroad. He's protected. But these nobodies that he meets with, right? These are people that are gonna get chewed up by the regime much more easily, right? They don't have, no one's gonna write, write newspaper articles in, uh, in the, the German daily about the fate of, of them, right? Vanyak might get a little, little note, but they won't. And so, so I think Howell's asking us to consider this, this, this line of argument. But I think if you read the plays, you can't help but admit that he's right not to participate in this disgusting system of monitoring. And after all, it's people's willingness to participate in it that perpetuates it. People accept comp their compromises they make and they make excuses for themselves for their participation in it, right? I had no choice. I was only helping out a friend. Or if I didn't do this, someone else would come along. They would put that other worse person in this job and then things would even be worse, right? And we can't help but feel the sadness 
of, and deep despair of Michael and Vera. Their need for Vanyak's approval is a cry for help. Their lives are, are pretty empty. But for all of Vanyak's difficulties and the privations that he faces due to his activities, right? He, some, he seems somehow possessed and whole in a way that his interlocutors are not. He seems happier in a kind of deeper, deeper sense. Um, and so I think Hava wants us to bring to a deeper level of appreciation for the difficulties that envelop people in the system. He wants to show that, but he also wants to show the cost of that participation. Um, Hava wants to suggest too, that the selfishness that I've been talking about um, is, is not selfishness in the, in the way that we think about it. Um, it's a kind of deep attention to one's own soul, right? So think about Socrates' encounter with Thrasymachus in, in book one. To counter Thrasymachus' understanding of justice, the first thing that Socrates does is to say, well, the pursuit of justice involves a kind of selflessness, right? You think about the good of other people. That's the surface argument. And he shows Thrasymachus uh, the different ways, right, that, that people think about the good of others. That's how to be just. But you'll also notice in that in, in book one, and I'm sure you all have, have read and discussed this in, in your classes, Socrates quietly makes a concession when he admits that people don't generally accept positions of political responsibility willingly. So justice does, Socrates quietly admits, have to include a motivation that includes your own good, right? And this is what Havel is trying to bring out, I think, with with dissent, that it does involve an attention to one's own good, but it's not in a kind of selfish, selfish rather, um, self-interested way. It's a concern with the status of your own soul and a kind of guarding of, of your own soul. Um, now, this kind of self-regard is dangerous, right? Because it can lead to a kind of self-satisfaction where you become kind of contemptuous of other people. Right, it might lead you to infl have an inflated sense of yourself and to look down on other people, and so I think Havel's art is meant to be a reminder of that temptation, and he wants to kind of warn people away from that. And the way that he does that um, is through the communication in these plays and in other plays through what he calls absurdity. He wants pe people to laugh at themselves and the crazy situations that they find themselves in in this regime. And he's especially, again, speaking to the dissident side of this, of this gulf, the danger of this overly serious self-confidence and this dangerous moralism. Um, if that kind of moralism and self-confidence is allowed to run riot, dissidents will be kind of without effect, right? People will just say, well, that's for the, what those people do, but I can't do that. Um, so permit me to read in conclusion, a kind of passage from Havel's autobiography where he tries to get out this, uh, this uh, difficulty. So it's a slide that's gonna take actually two, two slides, quote that's gonna take two slides. So um, he was asked, by the way, this is a long, it's an autobiography, but it's a long interview. And he was asked um, how, how he and his fellow dissidents can stand to laugh the stuff that they laugh at. So he says this, without the laughter, we would simply be unable to do serious things. If one were required to increase the dramatic seriousness in his face in relation to the seriousness of the problems he had to confront, he would quickly petrify and become his own statue. And such a statue could scarcely uh, write, I'm sorry, writer, I mistyped my quote, could scarcely write another historical manifesto or be equal to any human task. If you don't want to dissolve in your own seriousness to the point where you become ridiculous to everyone, you must have a healthy awareness of your own human ridiculousness and nothingness. As a matter of fact, the more serious what you are doing is, the more important it becomes not to lose that awareness. If you lose this, your own actions paradoxically lose their own seriousness. A human action becomes genuinely important when it springs from the soil of a clear-sighted awareness of the temporality and ephemerality of everything human. It is only this awareness that can breathe any greatness into any action. The outlines of genuine meaning can only be perceived from the bottom of absurdity. So 
um, I want to leave you. So Havel was trying to bring out this absurdity. I want to leave you with one anecdote, a story. Havel um, recorded uh, an audio recording of audience with his actor friend, Pavel Landowski. And he had that recording smuggled out through a Swedish junior hockey player at some point in the late, late seventies. They made copies of the recording and then they had those copies smuggled back in uh, to Czechoslovakia, um, you know, and presumably distributed around for people to, um, to have. Havel reportedly got in a taxi cab at, at one point in the late seventies and the guy, you know, the taxi credit artist, you're going to love this. He put in the, he put in the audio tape and it was a recording of, of audience. And this is the sort of absurd, uh, <laughs> absurd reality that, that Havel absolutely loved about, about life in, uh, in, uh, in such a, in such a regime. And, and so the, the, the plays became famous. People, people repeated these, these stock phrases and, and got a kick out of them. And um, and I think they went a long way into kind of reducing the mistrust between, you know, self righteous dissident and ordinary person trying to to get by. Uh, so let me stop there and and take your questions. I'm sorry I went a little longer than I had hoped, but um, happy to take any questions you might have. Well, Professor Taylor, that was that was great. Thank you very much. And we have several questions. And everybody in the audience, please uh, don't hesitate to type in any questions you might have for Professor Taylor. He's he's here and happy to speak with us about these things. So let me start with a couple of the questions that came in. I jotted them down, so I have them. Uh, this is from earlier in your talk. Uh, so I guess we're around 1975 at the point when you were speaking about fear and eager adaptation, and then the vast middle. So would you say that the apathy that you've used to characterize the vast middle is somehow distinctly postmodern for Havel? Is this po postmodern perhaps because there's something unique to communism and the tyranny experience therein? Or is this apathy part and parcel with all forms of tyranny, ancient and modern. Yeah, I, I think it's post, I think Havel would say it's post, has to do with postmodern. Um, Havel talks a lot of, in his letters to Olga, these are letters that he wrote to his wife in prison. They really, really won't, they weren't only actually letters to his, to his wife, they were letters to his, to his brother, who is also a kind of philosopher and friends and philosophic friends. So um, you know, he, he's up to some interesting stuff in those letters. Um, but he associates the, um, the kind of surrender to everydayness with the loss of a kind of moral horizon in a, in a deep sense, the loss of what he calls the absolute um, and, and a sense of, of human responsibility that you experience in, in light of of some, um, you know, unchanging, unchanging standard. Call it, call it nature. I don't think Havel ever calls it nature specifically, but um, he, he. So yeah, I think postmodernism. The answer he, he suggests that there are kind of two ways to that people um, experience the the loss of meaning and the loss of of moral horizon. One is the adoption of an ideology. He associates this with the kind of fanaticism to he, he uses these Heideggerian words, he says, it's an attempt to kind of grab being with a capital B, hold it in place, and give final answers to everything in life. So that's one possibility. And the other side of the spectrum is this resignation, this just retreat, the idea that there's no, there's nothing in life that gives meaning. And so I'm just going to opt out and, and go through, go through the motions. Um, the, the Russian writer that talks about this is Zinoviev. Um, I would recommend him too. But yeah, I think it, the answer is postmodern. Uh, should should I just give the one word answer? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, <laughs> the elaboration is most well. <laughs> so uh, Vanyak says, I can't participate in something I find repugnant, we're told. And, and when you said that to us, I couldn't help but remember this wonderful section from Churchill's Lights Are Going Out speech where he speaks of the importance of the word no. And he says, a free peoples must say no. 
This is the word of freedom, of progress, of tolerance, and goodwill. And then he speaks also of those who never learned the word no. Hmm. So it seems to run counter, this no or no say seems to run counter to the yes say of the apathy that you've described here. Yeah. And yet Vanyak is accused of acting out of privilege and sticking to his principles. So it's strange of how it is that one can make no saying appealing to other people. And, I'm, I'm, and finally, this is, I'm sorry for my long-winded question, but where I'm trying to go is, does the, the medium of writing a play as opposed to a letter, let's say, somehow give us access to, the, to any sort of empathy we might have for those who say no? Oh yeah, I think I think that's exactly what what Havel is trying to do in the plays is to, um, you know, by putting by by putting the brewmaster's speech out there and giving a kind of legitimacy to it, right? It makes it makes the no, I think, all the more all the more striking, right? You can you can beat me up, um, you know, as much as you want and and tell me that I'm a fancy intellectual, fancy writer, um, but that doesn't mean that that my principle is is wrong. Now that that presumes that the the, the interpreters of the play who who think that maybe he goes back in uh, the second time to to actually inform on himself, right, are wrong. But I, I I'm not of that opinion. Knowing what we know about Vanyak, you know, in the other two plays, I don't think it makes sense to me that he he would do that. Um, the other important thing that that one has to think about that Vanyak doesn't say, but um, and I don't think even Havel makes this argument, but you know Havel wasn't ha wasn't always Havel, and the people who say no and then get a reputation for saying no didn't always have the reputation. They had to start at some point when they were nobodies, right? So it doesn't it that that argument might work, you know, the tenth time they've said no, but it doesn't work. The first time and there's always has to be a first time for everyone and so even if you're someone in even if you are a fancy writer you know you don't know what's going to happen you, you can say oh i might have kind of reputation and protection but you know you don't know that for sure so um you know i think i think that that argument from well you're you're fancy intellectual doesn't doesn't really work once you think it through from where they had to people like Havel had to begin well, so let's move from refusing to participate in something one finds repugnant or saying no to then laughing. Uh, this is a question from the audience. Do you believe laughter as a form of dissent is still applicable to, to, to today's various forms of tyranny? And if so, what is the line between laughter being beneficial and laughter being harmful? Um, I would say it yeah I, there's not enough of there's not enough laughter and kind of sense of one's own absurdity uh on on, on the part of people who are dissenting today i, I think you have you you have um kind of the opposite the problem that uh, why i think Havel is is uniquely relevant is because we tend to um you know the people who are taking a stand um tend not to have a sense of their own ridiculousness. And so I think more laughter would be my suggestion to dissenters of today. And laughter can be healing and can attract people to your cause in a way that, um, you know, self-righteousness, however admirable, can sometimes be repelling. Yeah, excellent. Well, so let's, let's move then to uh, selfishness is another question we have. Um, on Havel's understanding of what I'm going to call a deeper sort of selfishness, which you've discussed with us. Um, is the starting point for legitimate dissent, understanding that the principle one fights for, or principles one fights for, are first and foremost good for the dissenter, good for the individual soul? And so then is the is this, is one soul where dissent itself is made good or bad? That is to say, is the soul the measuring stick of all of this? 
Um, I think so. That's a that's a deep question that I have to think about more. But my first inclination is to say yes. Uh, if you, I mean, maybe it makes sense too if if I say this, um, w with the exception of one person, all of the people I've interviewed uh, about um, about their experience in in dissent and you know why they did what they did. Um, all but one of them said they never expected to see the end of, of communism in their lifetimes. In other words, no one thought that their dissent would have concrete political results anytime soon. And so if that's true, then most people must be doing it for their own soul. And if you ask people, you know, who did what they did, who and who aren't writers or kind of deep um, thinkers in the way that um, you know Havel or Václav Bender or some of these other guys are, um, if you ask them why they did what they did, some sometimes you'll get, oftentimes you'll get a version of, I just couldn't live with myself anymore. And so that's a sort of ordinary, uh, ordinary life testament to ugh, i can't i just can't do it right and so that 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 then the, i think that would match with the soul as the measuring stick wow that's fantastic um that's really profound i think if if, if one thinks about it and says what is it when a human being says i just can't live with myself if i don't do something yeah say something so then this is a this is a nice segue into a, an audience question to what extent is convincing people of their lack of personal agency a necessary condition of tyrannical governments and of communist regimes? Do things like art, literature, and religion pose a threat to regimes that rely on the cultivation of personal apathy or hopelessness? Uh, agree. I mean, I don't. That's a very good. <laughs> that's a very good encapsulation. I think. Um, as, you know, all, all tyrannical regimes do that to an extent, but it's especially important for a totalitarian regime to do it. And they, you know, they, they depend in order for people to go through the motions of doing all these routine performances and, um, you know, lying and all of this stuff, you have to convince people that their personhood and their experience of the world doesn't doesn't matter, right? Everything has to be understood and filtered through their understanding of, of uh, you know, human life and through the ideology. And so you have to, the precondition is the, the crushing of the experience of agency, I think. And so this is another question from an audience member who, who it fits right with what you just said. Does squelching dissent require people then to live a lie? If this is done to preserve the regime, would we consider this then justice? I think the student has in mind something maybe like justice is law abidingness or something like this. So does squelching dissent require people to live a lie? If this is done to preserve the regime, isn't it then just just? Yeah, I mean, it would be just from the standpoint of the of the regime to squelch dissent because any any hint of, of heterodoxy is a sign that people are not what the regime says they are. Um, so yeah, if, if you wanted to be on the side of, of justice from the standpoint of the, of the regime, um, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd wanna be a, a sincere believer. I mean, Howell's argument though, is that there aren't very many sincere believers in the seventies and, and eighties. They're not, you know, people are not fervent enthusiasts um, as they might have been, and as many were in the 1950s. Right there, there had been too many five-year plans, uh, <laughs> too many, too many obvious ways that the that the things that were promised by the coming of socialism and communism were not were not brought to brought to bear. Right, and so then this leads us to where you would have to appeal to some principle beyond the the, the regime and, and its principles. Yeah. Well, and so, last thing, right? The one thing that Havel says in the in the letter 
And then another anecdote from Václav Benda, when people do step out of, whoop, I'm lost power. Oh, oh no. we can see you. Uh, wow. I'm in the shadow. pitch black. <laughs> the, I, think, I think someone was listening. Cost cutting measures. <laughs> so can you, can you hear me okay? Uh, loud and clear. All yes, right. Sir. So my, I guess my, my computer is working. So we'll just, I don't know, pretend everything is normal. This is a great way to end a lecture on, on descent, right? The, yeah. the powers are trying to crush any hint. Um, so I was going to, I was going to say the, the, uh, the way that people tried to talk sense into Benda or Havel uh, is to say, oh, you'd be much better off. You'd be happier you know, your family would be better off if you didn't do this. It wasn't that, oh, you're not being a good, faithful communist. It's that you could live a better life, right, if you, if you did X or Y. Well, so, so, so take us then uh, out of this um, bad joke, darkness. Uh, <laughs> what would you say are the most important then positive principles underlying Havel's descent? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would just repeat some of the things I've already said. Um, you know, having having a sense of oh, here we're back. I guess the the generator came on. I guess I'm not. I was worried I was in trouble. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, having a sense of your own of your own soul, a sense of moral responsibility that you can. Um, a sense of enacting that responsibility in the world, right? Means can mean refusing to do things. It can mean more positively, you know, taking responsibility to, to care for your fellow citizens. That that's one um, end of it. But then I guess I would emphasize, I mean, that, that seems, you know, pretty common and, and, and obvious in a way, but um, I, I think that that quotation that I ended with is important, right? Really having a sense of your own limitations and the absurdity of, of the situations that you find yourselves, right? Just having, having that ability to, to not take yourself so seriously um, and laugh at the situations you find yourself in, um, you know, can attract people to, to dissent and, and to think through, you know, the plays are an effort to, to get people to laugh at the situations that they took for granted in their everyday life. So he has a he has a play called the memorandum where a, a person works in an office and they're trying to invent a new language. And so, you know, anyone who's worked in a kind of bureaucratic office and been tasked with something ridiculous, you know, will have, will have a connection to that, to that play and the experience of, of absurdity. Right. And, and so that, I think that's the, the takeaway that I would say Havel's Havel has that, that is most, um, kind of immediate to our situation. Well, Professor Taylor, I think that's a, a perfect place to end. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this oh, it's been my pleasure. I had a lot of fun. I hope, yeah, I hope people enjoyed it. And uh, people should, should feel free to shoot me an email if they have questions that uh, we didn't get to answer. I know time is, time is short and I blathered on a little bit longer than I had hoped. So uh, F Taylor at skidmore.edu and uh, fire, fire away. Well, well, thanks so much. And thanks for your time. Thanks uh, to all of our audience for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope you have a good evening. <laughs>